Okay, so we've done, so we know how to prove an implication. Now we're going to use a common technique uh, of mathematics, which is, hey, look, this is something new. And then it's like, well, wait a second. It's not new. It's actually something I know how to do. It's just wrapped in a different package. And the first thing that we can talk about is the idea of a if and only if biconditional. So if my conjecture is that please prove that left if and only if right. If that's my conjecture, how do I do that? And I would like that particular thing to be a tautology. Well, the first technique that I can use on this is to say that, all right, I've never seen a biconditional. All I know how to use is actually implication. Well, I can turn a biconditional into an implication. Uh, a biconditional of a if and only if literally is take the left, imply the right, and then the only-ish condition, the right, must imply the left. And so they just simply flip around. And so if I would look at it this way, and I would say, hey, look, uh, proving this means this needs to be a tautology. Well, if that needs to be a tautology, and this is an and, that would mean that the only way for this to be a tautology is that both must be true. And so what's happened for my problem is what I thought was one problem has become we have two cases to actually show, right? The first case is that show left implies right, and then the second case is that the right implies left. And so both of which I know how to do. I know how to do implications. So my one problem of a biconditional is actually two problems. Show the left implies the right, and then the right implies the left. So if somebody says, please show that left if and only if the right, well, that just simply means prove one direction and prove the other direction. I actually have two problems to do. On the other hand, a second technique to use is just simply use logical equivalencies. Well, why can I use logical equivalencies? Well, because if you had a P if and only if Q actually was a tautology, that means that P is logically equivalent to Q. So if you want to show, if you want to actually show this, it's enough to say, oh, okay, I'll start off at P and ask, I'm going to use some way of discussing logical equivalencies to get a new version of it. But then if I use some logical equivalencies and reason discussion, I know that this is actually logically equivalent to some other step. But then, well, if I use logical equivalencies and some reason discussion, this is actually blah, 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 until finally Q shows up, and then you would be done. All right, as far as proofs go, you know, going, starting off with the first statement and say, oh, but by using modus tonin, sorry, modus ponens, by using um, de Morgan's law, it's actually called logical equivalency because modus ponens is a rule of inference. You know, if I use de Morgan's law and then associative property and then I use the disjunctive version of implication, this particular thing, P, has become this variant of the compound proposition. But these are true in these same conditions, so it must be the same as this compound proposition, and which must be, and you continue this reason discussion using logical equivalencies until finally the last guy shows up. And that's pretty rare for this to happen. Most of the time when we do our proofs, we have to do it as a two-step process. If you want to prove by conditional? You're going to have to show left implies right, and you're going to have to show uh, right implies left as you go through it. So really what happens is for the conjecture of biconditional, it's not anything new. It was my old conjecture twice. So it's actually kind of just taking my old skills and wrapping them up in a new package.
Okay, another approach to that would be, what if I would have a bunch of, say, cases? What if I would have that I would have premise one, or I could have premise two, or it's not, sorry, not premise, proposition one, or proposition two, or proposition, say, K. And this all goes to a single conclusion. An example like this would be, the number one, if you had the number one, or the number two, or the number three, or all the way up to the number 10, then this thing holds for all of those numbers. So that's what you would say. Well, again, I can use a logical equivalency. I've never seen this before. I only know how to do a single thing implies a single thing. Well, this is logically the same as, I could just distribute the implies through, P1 implies Q, and then P2 implies Q. And then we would continue on until we get PK implies Q, but each of these ors become ands, and that's the same thing. Well, if I want this entire thing to be a tautology, that means I want this entire thing to be a tautology. But the only way for this to be a tautology is it's under conjunction. That means every one of these must be true. And so, that's why we call it a proof by cases. What happens is, if it looks like this, we need to prove all k cases as you go through it. And so you have to prove the first that P1 does imply Q, and then you have to show the second, P2 and does imply Q, and then we go all the way down to the kth, which is PK implies Q. And now we have, well, that's just K of things I already know how to do. And you would ask, well, how would I show the first? You got five choices. Well, obviously, you'd pick the big three. Direct, contraposition, contrapositive, because vacuous and trivial tends to not show up. But those are your five choices. Vacuous, trivial, direct, contraposition, contradiction. You just go through and check all five ways and try to prove each one of these. And so this is no longer this isn't one problem. It's K problems. This actually gets down to on terms of proof by cases where we handle all cases. Is another example of this is if I tell you for all X P of X, but I only have a finite domain. And so this was like, well, is the predicate true for X1? And is the predicate true for X2? And is everything the predicate true for xk. This is again still cases. Normally if it looks like this example where I'm handling all k cases where I'm saying I'm just going to test the entire domain and we just show true for all things in the domain. If you show true for all things in the domain uh, yes, this is still a proof by cases, but it usually gets a special name, uh, which is not proof by cases, but rather what's called a exhaustive proof. Still a proof by cases, but since we handled an entire finite domain, we get a give it its own little special name, which is proof by exhaustion or exhaustive proof. You definitely would say that the word exhaustive applies if this domain is finite, but say 100 numbers. You, know, you have to do 100 cases one at a time. It's a little annoying. And then you would have to go and show every single one of these. And yeah, you would be exhausted at the end. So anyways, if you just do one, it's not enough. You got to do all of them. As you can tell, if any one of these is ever false, Right? If that ever happened, then the entire thing would be false, and this would not be a, a fact. The conjecture would be, you know, it wouldn't turn into a fact, it wouldn't turn lemma, lemma, theorem, whatever you want to change the name. It's just not true, right? And so the entire thing would be false, and you would call this one that you found to be false, you would call it the counterexample. If no such counterexample exists, and it ends up being true always, it's true, and we've exhaustively proved it because we did every single thing that we're wor working on on that particular problem. All right, um, let's try an example of that. An example of that would be things like uh, if, say, n is equal to 1, 2, 3, or 4, 
then n squared plus 1 is going to be greater than or equal to 2 to the nth. Now normally the exponential will become bigger, but for these few numbers, whenever we take this, and so we would look at this and say, all right, just kind of go through it. And for these particular values, is this true? We would do 1, 2, 3, or 4. We have that, and so the proof by cases, so case number 1, we would have to show that n equals 1 better imply that n squared plus 1 is greater than or equal to 2 to the n. Well, that's my implication. So what do I do? I assume n equals 1. <laughs> and now, if n is equal to 1, what does that mean about that would then imply that 1 squared plus 1 is this greater than 2 to the 1. And so, well, 2, is that greater than or equal to 2? This is true. So yeah, the truth of the left has implied the truth of the right, and so we're due, and then we would continue for each number. You would go through, you know, for n equal to 2, n equal to 3, n equal to 4. You get an implication for each of these, just like we did here. It's like you have left, implies a conclusion. Next, implies a conclusion. Next, implies a conclusion, and we have to do them all. And so you can go through this entire thing to prove it out. And once I handle all the cases, this particular thing would be true.